Okay, let's go right away. Again, like it's, it's, an, it, it's what you're yeah, suggesting is an interesting thing because you don't want it to look like too. You want it to look like you're wounded, but you're, you're still going for it. Do you know what I mean? At, at the time, people get tend to forget Batman was the biggest movie of all time, most expensive movie, and there was a lot of people's careers riding on this thing, um, especially at, at the Warner Brothers end. A lot of money involved in this thing. The set at Pinewood Studios was spectacular. There was nothing like Gotham City. I can't quite explain why movies like this are difficult to keep track of except to say they are enormous and I'm amazed at Tim and and everyone else who worked on it I mean everyone else who worked on it because everyone has to kind of keep up with it one of the things I think I had about this movie is I knew how big it was gonna be you know I knew this for instance they had a good feeling about it but in the area which I'm involved in it all I don't care but I mean it also cost me some dough they were totally unprepared for the level of the success of the movie. It was Tim's vision. It was his eye. You know, once you bought that, you bought that eye. The question was, how much does it cost, and where can you make it less expensive? Not cheap, less expensive, or as inexpensively or as controlled as possible. And that brought us to, the, to, to England to do that. It was a big movie, and there wasn't really the space uh, in at, at Warner's to do it, so there wasn't a lot going on in England. So uh, Pinewood Studios seemed like a really prime candidate because it had the space and it had a backlot area where you could build out on, which was nice. And it was, you know had the artists and you know talented people to make a project like that go. And for me, it's a way of sort of being away from all of the business side of trying to focus on the movie, which was important and good, and you know, kind of away from all of the hype that was back in, in, in America about it. Because, you know, when you're making a movie, you don't like getting caught up in all that because you, you have to make it. So I think it turned out the right place to do it. I think a lot of it, I'm sure, was Anton first, who was an incredible, dark, interesting character. If you looked at Anton, you know, you eager to played a part in Batman very easily, well, that's good, Tim Burton. So you had these two guys, and you had Roger Pratt, who's a wonderful photographer, I guess really kind of balancing the two out a little bit, you know, because Anton would go off and craze ideas that sometimes weren't possible. His team would bring him back a bit. Tim had really wonderful ideas. He knew exactly the look he wanted. It was a tough shoot during the winter of 88, you know, December, long nights. We used to be filming up on the Gotham streets and, you know, you'd start at four o'clock in the afternoon. It was already dark in England and you'd film right through till, you know, five or six in the morning. It was still dark. You never saw daylight and it went on for weeks on end. It was a difficult shoot because it was, for the entire shoot, it was a six-day shoot. But I don't think I'd ever do it again because I, I found it quite counterproductive. I mean, you're... you're if you're shooting a movie, you're basically working every day anyway. So, if you're shooting six days, though, you don't have really any time to prepare for the next week. So, I kind of felt like a, a fighter in the middle of a fight who didn't have time to take a break, just take a step back. So, it was a difficult shoot uh, that way, and it was, uh, you know, in the winter at night. So, like, for three months, I didn't think I saw daylight at all. Once we got in production, the astounding thing to me about Tim was and is the unshakable central self-confidence and lack of fear that he has. When I watched him, this was part of the scuttlebutt, his Batman was the biggest production in history in England in terms of production costs and so forth and so forth. And watching him and you see this, you, I'm pretty low-key, you see it on me. You don't see pressure on this kid. And I'm thinking, geez, this guy's in his early 20s. He's got the biggest budget in history. It's not even a factor. You know, he just goes about his business and does it. 
being relatively new to, you know, the first big movie, uh, I, I was very grateful for Jack's support because, you know, he, he told me, you know, he just said, don't let them, you just get what you need, you know, and don't let them get to you and that kind of thing. Just it was really cool that way and helping me get through the process. Tim was under a lot of pressure. He hadn't had that big blockbuster yet, so it wasn't like, you know, whatever you want, Mr. Burton. So um, there was definitely pressure. I mean, there was pressure between him and, and John Peters at times, and I think John, you know, made some good contributions, uh, that, that some of the fight scenes he really insisted upon. But, uh, you know, there was definitely pressure between the studio and the producers and Tim just to sort of, you know, get it all done and get it all good. It was such a great challenge to me that I had all my work cut out staying alive. There was a whole old school of, uh, of production that in a way probably thought better people could do it than me, certainly. Not that it was um, blatant, but I think there was that feeling. So I was struggling to do what Tim wanted. I also think that, in a certain sense, he was considered to be very young to be doing that sort of thing and doing things which no one else had done. Batman, the first Batman, was made the old-fashioned way, you know, with model shots and that type of thing. But most things we did in Batman were done for, for real, you know, whereas nowadays you, you, you have the luxury of um, doing a quarter of it and someone on a clever computer does the other three quarters. But I think that's why the first Batman has such honesty about it. Is it Halloween? Part of what went very right on this picture, collaborative ideas on a real level about the material itself. Halfway through shooting, um, Jack and John Peters go to see the Phantom of the Opera. And at the end of Phantom of the Opera, there's a scene where she goes up to the tower. And the Phantom and the big conflict at the end, the big climax, take, takes place at the tower. I don't know how the story went if John turned to Jack, Jack turned to John, but said, you know, this is what we need. And the next day, they started writing that scene, the whole ending in the tower. A script is a blueprint. It isn't the Bible. It's a blueprint for a movie. It's a navigational stake for all the components that make a movie. It, it is capable of being changed. It is changed. Lines happen, things happen, and you see the evolution of the material. You saw the scenes that were shot before, and you realize all of a sudden, I already have that value. This scene now has to get a different value. You know, in a project this big sometime, I've come to know you can't say, hey, we'll wing it to everything. You have to be well prepared. But having said that, because of the original freedom and, and, and gradual trust with the whole group of people making the movie, a lot of this movie comes from just moments of improvisational inspiration right there. Some before, so or o overnight, or as you went. Some actually while you're doing it. I plead innocent. Didn't do it. Didn't do it. I did not have the Joker being uh, the murderer of Batman's parents. That was something that, that Tim had wanted, you know, from early on, and I had a bunch of arguments with him and wound up, you know, talking him out of it for as long as I was on the script. But once the script went into production, there was a writer's strike underway, and so I wasn't able to be with the production as it was shooting over in, uh, uh, over in London, and they brought in, you know, uh, other people. You know, there's certain little punch-up things you want to do, uh, dialogue here, this, you know, a little bit more Joker this, uh, Batman that, you know, little things. But those little things end up sort of turning into big things, you know, and it also has to do with budget and things and what can we do, what can we not do. By suggesting a few little changes sometimes, it just it sometimes has a tendency to kind of just... In, in fact, some people complain that, you know, by letting... Vicky Vale into the back cave that uh, that was too much. So you know it's 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 a it's a difficult crowd to please. Oh. <laughs> I, and I didn't write that one either. I mean I I I, I want I, I've been asked about it so many times. That's that's the one that they asked me about. Said, How could you have Alfred just let Vicky into the bat cave? And I have to say you know I I agree with you. That is that is Alfred's last day of employment at Wayne Manor. The shooting schedule had gotten to the point where things had to be kind of wrapped up quickly there, and that's how that came about. 
The idea that script changes, of course it changes. It's just the blueprint. And of course actors ad lib. And of course the lighting changes. And of course opportunities arise. That's why it's called filmmaking. You know what I mean? You're making something. You know, it, 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 it's the process that makes the magic. We work give and take together. A lot of the spirit of what we all wound up going for in the script, in refining and in the shooting of the picture comes from that kind of thinking, you know, fun kind of collaboration. I was working up these ideas and uh, there was a lot of skepticism about whether I was the right guy for the film, which I understood because I'd never done a big film, I'd never done a big budget film, I'd never done an action film. So I really had to prove myself, and I'll, I'll never forget, there's a presentation I had to make. John Peters was there, who I, I think was very skeptical. At first. I know he was skeptical. And Tim was there, and I was playing this idea and that idea. It was a little bit scattered, because that's the way my brain works. And John didn't understand this process, and I could see his face was like, I could already see, it, like, the bubble over his head. I wonder if this composer is available, or that composer. And, um, and Tim said, play the march, play the march, play the march. And I put on this Batman march, and John jumped out of his chair. Really just almost started dancing around the room. It just definitely was not an easy, relaxed project. But I've learned since then that none of these, you know, kind of shows like that ever are. Yeah. And, just, and even even if you're at the end of it, too, if you... Because, I don't know, she's moving her head up. So yeah, she's moving her head up. So. Once you set the date for a film, you say, we're going out, and you declare that date to the marketplace on June 19th, a set of forces are in action. You set that whole motion in action. The exhibitors, the distributors, the media, all the people, and everybody builds towards that date. It's very perilous to change it. Very perilous. I don't mean to change it a day or two, but you start changing it a week or a month, three things happen. One, they think the film's no good. Two, it costs an enormous amount of more money. And three, you get out of sync with all the forces that you've used to market the film, to bring it to that moment where the expectation of the audience is realized by the movie. So what you really want to look at is once a studio picks a date, it creates a lot of force for you, but it creates a lot of drama around you. It's hard now to explain just how unique the anticipation was for Batman and the explosive nature of the fans and the movie-going audience as it was gearing up and getting closer and closer to its release date. At the time when we made the movie, there was no real talk of uh, the word franchise or you no know, real market, you know, not a lot of merchandise. It was sort of pre all of that kind of stuff that now is just commonplace, really. The first Batman movie, in my estimation, was the best marketed movie in the history of film. It was incredible. You couldn't walk 10 feet without seeing someone in a Batman t-shirt or a Batman baseball cap. People were buying the Batman ties, the t-shirts, the hats, the cufflinks, the underwear, everything. It was like pajamas. That Halloween, the next Halloween, everyone wanted to be Batman. I think when I saw the Batman cereal, that's when it hit me, you know. Whoa. Every bit of joke or byproduct and paraphernalia sold before the movie was released. They were out. They could have sold billions and billions more of these things, but, you know, you make these situations, you got to make the deals, got to be manufactured, shipped, all this. You can't just say, give me 2,000 more Joker, you know what I mean? So, in a way that's uncommon, you know, apropos of hype or this or that, they... They had more customers than they had product for this particular movie. I remember one day somebody brought in a logo and we all looked at it and said, what is that? It looks like somebody inside of somebody's throat. It was the logo for, for Batman. What made it unique is you didn't know exactly what it was for the first second. And then, like so many visual images, it emerged exactly what it was, so it required something to happen in your brain. And that risk of that, of that logo embodied the aesthetic cinematic equivalent of the risk of the film. This is beautiful. You know what I mean? This is a great piece of graphic art. And you know, that goes all the way back to Bob Kane. That emblem, and the Batman emblem, that's what really sold everything. That emblem. You didn't have to say more. You didn't have to do anything but show that, that those bat wings. Then Mark Hanton and Peters wanted the Prince music. 
You know, he kept saying, we're gonna have Prince do songs because Mark Canton's big hit up to this point had been Purple Rain. And where, and where is the Batman? Prince was also a Warner Brothers artist, so I think we had talked about several different artists and coming up with something, and uh, he came up with some crazy song, and it became, that was a huge hit. And I think that, that hit before the movie. So that was a great sort of juggernaut with it. I do remember meeting him for the first time in the back cave. You know, he kind of actually fit, you know, when he, when he walked in, it was kind of funny. You know, we, we used three fourths of his songs in the movie, and then, you know, he had written so many songs that they sort of released a companion conceptual album that he had, had done. So I guess it was the first time that I'd ever gotten an idea of like studio conceptualizing about things. Keep busting. Vicki Vale. Hi. Bruce Wayne. And what do you do for a living? We cut this 30-second trailer. We took it to Westwood, and we decided to test it by just sticking in front of an audience. And we did, and we got a standing ovation for this trailer. It was such an incredible demand to see that trailer that movie theaters were being contacted to find out what time the trailers were showing, and people were paying to see movies they didn't care about just to watch the Batman trailer, and then they got up and they left the theater. I'll never forget that trailer. Such an amazing trailer they put out, the first trailer for the movie, which some people call a teaser. I flat out call it a trailer because it showed a lot of footage and kind of give you a hint of the plot. You know, they really literally could have had somebody come out with a chalkboard and just wrote, Batman. That could have been the whole trailer, and all of us would have been like, ah! I remember sitting there watching what must have been like maybe 90 seconds of, of the trailer on TV and going like, wow, that looks great. Nicholson looks phenomenal and scary and the suit looks good and the darkness and the world, I was thinking like, oh, this, this rocks. This is gonna be really, really good. It was meant to kind of stop the negative rumor mill, I think. It was a way to kind of stop the campy camp talk. It, of course, unfortunately also became the hot item at uh, comic book and science fiction conventions as people started paying up to $25 just to get a copy of the trailer. Bus stations where the posters were were being broken into and people were taking the posters out. There was a dearth of posters all around that had to continually be replaced. Something very different, something very big was brewing. And again, it comes back to this masterful marketing strategy that the studio had put together. I can remember the single piece of hype that I did, though. So now the year it's coming, this is the way I felt about this movie. The year it's coming out, I'm down to the Oscars, where all of show business is there and so forth. And uh, I run a Jack Valenti friend of mine comes up to me I'm in the toilet catching a break downstairs and Jack comes up just well you know he's very enthusiastic man I'm the Batman and into my head flew this I looked him in the eye and said Jack let me tell you something serious there isn't a single person in the movie industry qualified to estimate the top on Batman he said what you guy, what? You know, the movie's not out yet, but this is my idea of street publicity. You know, I got Jack Valenti, I know. And sure enough, that show was not over before the story was starting to come back to me from the people who were at the Oscars this year. So I knew I'd done a real good job of guerrilla promotion with that one. Once the ball gets rolling and people can perceive it's going to be successful, everybody climbs on the train. Everybody wants a piece of the action. In this case, the distribution group saw that they could make a lot of money because they had a lot of what we call pent-up desire about the film. Not just curiosity, desire. Not just interest, but definite interest. Number one interest, seeing it first and across a broad core. A very wide age audience was looking at it. And it was both male and female. So the idea was to get it as wide as possible, as broad as possible, as fast as possible. And this was one of the first films, if not the first film, that set the stage for one of these mega releases. You know, a large number of screens, a very concentrated media push in that pre-week, week area, in order to grab all the money in and create a firestorm, create something that would feed on itself. 
rather than having to be fed by further advertising. And it was a bold stroke. It was, a, it was the idea was one which said that if there was a failure, it would be on a grand scale. I remember uh, stories when the theater owners first saw Batman on the preview, and they were scared. They were scared because it was so dark and that people didn't know how it was going to go. You know, the theater owners were generally older people who were conservative, and, you know, they wanted a real happy, 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 and Batman wasn't just, wasn't that. But to the young and to everybody else, it was a different experience. It was exciting. We couldn't have been happier <laughs> in the summer of 89. I mean, it was so wonderful to see a, another DC comic book character on the big screen in a way that did things that movies did that we couldn't do in the comics, and yet at the same time were true to the underlying material. That was a thrill. Holy Hollywood premiere. It's the L.A. opening of Batman the Movie. Maybe the almost full moon Monday night made the thousands of fans waiting outside the Westwood Theater batty. Some staked out choice viewing spots days earlier just to see the Bat Stars come out. The night of the premiere um, was a very touching moment for both of us, especially Bob. As the car started to turn and we saw, it was like New Year's Eve on Times Square, and Bob looked at me, and even now I get a chill talking about it because his eyes just welled up with tears. He had never experienced this before, you know, and he was thinking, later he said to me, how, why would so many people like turn up for, you know, something I create. I mean, he just could, you know, he couldn't fathom it. He really couldn't fathom it. But it was just so very touching because that meant the world to him to have that many people turn out. I think the premiere was on a Monday night in Westwood. And, and by the Wednesday, there were people camped outside the theater waiting for the movie to open on the Friday. And by Friday, there was a, a line around the whole block. People dressed up and make up like the Joker and all sorts of things. It was quite amazing that everybody had been caught up in this whole Batmania thing. Well, no, you think you can really prepare yourself because it's, it's a surprise. I think it's, a, it's always a surprise to me whether it's a success or failure. I mean, I get equally shocked by both. You know, when you're making a film, some things are in your control and then some things are out of your control. So you try not to dwell too much on the things that are out of your control. George Martin, the great, uh, Sir George Martin, I should say, who was the great producer of the Beatles, was once interviewed and said, the great thing about the Beatles is they were of their time. And I think that's important of any blockbuster, of any huge success. You have to be of your time. The timing has to be right. And the timing was right for Batman. Tim and everybody who worked on that film had pulled it off. The wheel had been reinvented. The whole genre of what we had considered to be